All right, so uh, thank you everybody for being here. This is the uh, first Zoom meeting in uh, phase two of the Greensboro Community Land Trust. Um, we're here with uh, my colleague, uh, Grant Duffield, out of the Housing and Neighborhood Development Department. My name is Troy Powell, Neighborhood Impact Manager with the Housing and Neighborhood Development Department for the City of Greensboro. And we also have our uh, technical advisor here with us, Jason Webb from Grounded Network Solutions, uh, that'll be providing you with the presentation. Uh, so we do thank you for uh, taking part in this process. If you do have any questions, uh, as Jason uh, provides his presentation, you're welcome to type those in the chat. We'll monitor those and we'll be sure that uh, that all your questions are answered uh, and we'll try to keep uh, the presentation to uh, less than one hour. All right, Jason. Thanks, Troy. Again, thanks everybody for taking the time. Um, we have put together a uh, presentation to to walk folks through how where we are and where we are going. So again, as what Troy said, this is a part of phase two of the Community Land Trust for Greensboro, North Carolina. Just as a part of introduction, a little background on myself. Um, I am the Community and Technical Assistance Principal here at Grounded Solutions Network. Come to this work with close to 40 years of experience working with inside Community Land Trust all throughout the United States. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts led one of the uh, largest urban community land trusts here in the country for 15 years as their director and then 10 years on their board of directors. Here at Grounded Solutions, I manage all of our uh, technical assistance work from coast to coast. So I have clients that are in Seattle and at all the way to having clients in Baltimore, Maryland. So just a quick recap of where we have been on, on this journey. Um, you know, the in 2023, um, the conversations with inside of the city really started to um, get more and more into how to think about implementing this type of a model. And uh, Grounded Solutions was uh, selected as, um, you know, getting under contract for the first of three phases of work, which was our public education phase. Uh, I did a site visit to Greensboro uh, along with Troy. Uh, the city went ahead and held five in-person educational workshops where I did a, a community land trust 101. And we also uh, did not just one, but actually two online workshops. Uh, you know, in total, we met with over a hundred people about the model. And one of the great things that we heard was positive feedback that folks were uh, supportive of this idea. They were a little bit shocked that Greensboro was a little bit late to actually have one of these established when you see the other CLTs that are actually in your state. And the city went ahead and actually launched a dedicated uh, web page that they're hosting that Grounded Solutions have, have given them resources to post. Also, one, one of the things that was a part of the work was talking about an advisory committee that got established. And here are some of the names that are that are on that committee. Um, and we have already started to look at some program design uh, for the business plan development, which is where we are right now. So where where we expect to go is, uh, you know, Grounded Solutions is returning for the second phase of work. Uh, we uh, did some community uh, events already um, to, again, get feedback on the idea of the Community Land Trust and the skeleton of the business plan. And we're continuing to do public education events for lenders, future homeowners, and for partners. As we think about the, the next phase, which is 2024 and beyond, we're going to, you know, uh, build out the community land trust. So uh, there will be an official launch of it. We're going to be looking at staffing. We're going to start to develop policies and procedures, and we're going to be doing um, our first project design. Again, as we look at coming out of phase two 
going into phase three. But just as a quick recap of a quick Community Land Trust 101, I did see in the registration that a number of you have not taken, um, ha have not been a part of our in-person uh, education. So we wanted to make sure that you were caught up. So the Community Land Trust model here in the United States um, is a 54 plus year old model. It, it actually stems back all the way to the 60s where an American dele delegation went over to Israel to take a look at a new type of land ownership model. Now, the, the folks that were looking for a new land ownership model were pri predominantly black farmers in the South. The very next year in 1969, they went ahead and they established the first community land trust here in the United States called New Communities Incorporated. Uh, this first community land trust was predominantly focused on agriculture and having a safe space for um, black farmers to be able to farm without the threat of being pushed off of their land. Um, New Communities Incorporated started with 6,000 acres of land. And at that time, they were the largest uh, black owned landowners in the entire United States. In the 70s, the motto itself started to take more of an urban uh, turn where the first urban community land trust was established in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. In the 80s is when we really started to see some of the first community land trusts get started with government assistance. Now, whether that is through uh, you know, grants or whether that is through um, staff time, the, the city started to get involved with establishing and helping to lift up the community land trust. Also in our timeline, 1985, New Communities Inc. actually lost all of its land to foreclosure. And you know the important thing about the way that they lost their land was not due to mismanagement or not due to a flawed uh, design. It was predominantly because of the racist policies that were gripping, uh, especially the state of Georgia, where for five straight years, they were in a series of droughts and their community land trust could not get government backed loans to be able to bridge them to the next year. Uh, so they actually had to go out and actually mortgage all of their property. And unfortunately, they were not able to make those payments and then their land was for, foreclosed upon. But the story of New Communities Inc. doesn't stop there. In the 90s, they actually signed on to a class action lawsuit against the state of Georgia and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the federal agency that was actually doing a lot of the loans at the time. And they uh, laid out a very compelling case that talked about the racist policies that you know the state of Georgia and the USDA was was performing at the time, and that was the loss, and that resulted in the loss of their land. So they got a twelve million dollars se settlement uh, from the federal government, and New Communities Inc. actually got rebirth um, a few years ago, where they went out and they actually purchased more land. Um, and they are continuing their operations to this date. Now, the community land trust model itself is actually pretty extensive here in the United States with over 300 community land trusts nationwide. We've seen amazing growth in the 1990s and we're seeing amazing growth now. The motto itself is in 46 states plus the District of Columbia and in Puerto Rico. And over the time that homeowners have been living in CLT homes, approximately now 32 years, there's been over 30,000 units built. For your state of North Carolina, your state actually has the distinction of holding one of the older community land trusts, and that's in Durham, North Carolina. But that's not where uh, your state stopped, where you have a number of other community land trusts that are actually throughout the entire state, where uh, this model has been talked about here in Greensboro and also in uh, High Point. 
this is a this is an infographic that comes right off of the city's uh, dedicated webpage on CLTs, and it basically just walks through what the process of what a community land trust is. And so we put in this visual where, again, the homeowner that is going to be buying this home is going to be buying the structure of the home. And the community land trust is going to own the land forever. It's a 99-year ground lease that actually brings the improvements and the land together. And uh, that is the ground lease is what makes the home now permanently affordable so that it doesn't just help one family, but can help future generations as well. To actually uh, help with this, one of the things that we've developed at Grounded Solutions is a two minute video that explains this a lot more. Community land trusts, or CLTs, are nonprofit organizations that acquire, own, and steward land permanently for the common good. The most common CLT land use is housing, but retail, office, and a variety of other uses are possible. CLTs give formal decision-making voice and power to local community residents in determining land uses. Here's how CLTs make home buying affordable for families in their communities. First, the CLT builds or buys homes using one-time public or private investment. Next, the CLT sells just the home to a low-income buyer who qualifies for a mortgage. And the CLT keeps the land, holding it in trust for future generations of home buyers. In return for being able to buy a home at a discounted price, the family agrees to pay it forward and sell to another low-income family at a price they can afford. The CLT manages the sales process, ensuring that each home buying family builds some wealth from a predetermined, limited amount of the sales proceeds. In this way, the one-time public or private investment in CLT homes makes lasting affordability a reality and stabilizes communities. And CLTs benefit the larger community too, as they preserve and protect housing for long-term residents, helping to build stronger, safer, and higher quality diverse neighborhoods contributing to greater educational attainment, employment opportunities, and health outcomes. Visit GroundedSolutions.org to learn more about CLTs today. So that's a quick two-minute video about what a community land trust is. And one of the things I love to uh, lift up is that the community land trust has some core elements that have been uh, given to us by the founders of this model. Membership and governance is incredibly important. Holding land and subsidy and trust and this idea of stewardship um, is what makes up a community land trust. So each one of these elements, when you add them together, is what uh, a community land trust is all about. Now, the idea that a, uh, a house is permanently affordable just because we say it is um, is not necessarily true. What it requires is oversight and support. And what that falls into a broad category is what's called stewardship. So community land trusts are doing stewardship in three different ways all at the same time. So first, they're actually stewarding the structures of the home. We want to make sure that as a community land trust, as we partner with developers and as we do our own development one day, that we're using high quality material because we want these homes to last, not just for one generation, but for multiple generations. We're also stewarding the homeowners and making sure that they are not being taken advantage of through a process around home buying. So one of the things that the community land trust will do is we will oversee how folks get mortgages, what mortgage products that they're getting to make sure that they're getting something that they can truly afford. The other part of this stewardship is stewarding the subsidy dollars, the public funds that are gonna be going into these homes to make it permanently affordable. So these public funds, one of the promises that the community land trust is making is that again, it's gonna serve multiple generations and that these homes are going to be now permanently affordable. So when homeowners are ready to resell their homes, 
again, the community land trust is going to be that partner that's going to be working with them step by step to make sure that they um, are selling their home for the resale restricted price and it's going to another income el eligible buyer. So, so now I want to turn a little bit to your community land trust that has been thought about for Greensboro and talk a little bit about some of the elements of what, what we are thinking about. So some general information about the Greensboro Community Land Trust is that the Community Land Trust is gonna be structured under a 501c3 nonprofit structure. This is the tried and true uh, way that most community land trusts are organized, are set up structurally. Uh, right now, we are looking at 11 to a 15 uh, member board of directors. Uh, when you get anything above 15 uh, board, board members, it starts to get very, very uh, costly when you're trying to work on people's schedules, when you're trying to coordinate. So our rule of thumb is that we keep it to um, 15 maximum, but, but usually 11 to 15 is the sweet spot. We are proposing that this community land trust is going to follow a classic community land trust model. And that is that it's going to be a membership based organization, which means that anyone with inside of the limits of Greensboro can sign up to become a member of the community land trust and eventually go ahead and elect some, some of the board members that will uh, govern the or organization moving forward. But we're going to phase membership into the development of the organization. So after 20 units are developed through the Community Land Trust is when we're going to go ahead and activate that membership base. Uh, right now, we are looking at two to four staff members when you think about the different roles that uh, the Community Land Trust is going to be doing. Some of that is going to depend on what other partnerships we can continue to develop along the way, whether we need to do some staffing functions or whether that is a partner that's going to be doing those functions. And lastly, the multiple partnerships with developers and other organizations are going to be key to the success of the Community Land Trust. Now, as we think about some of the nuts and bolts of the Community Land Trust and where we are, where we have heard the need is that home ownership is going to be the primary focus right now. Other forms of housing can easily come into the Community Land Trust. And if the Community Land Trust sees an opportunity to be able to do something that's outside of home ownership, um, then it's going to evaluate that. But as of right now, we, we're looking at the community land trust being home ownership centric and uh, leading in, in that work. Some of the other pieces is that we're looking at income levels, uh, targets that are 80% of the area median income and below. Um, we're already, uh, we've already done the analysis that the resale formula that fits best with Greensboro is going to be a fixed rate at 2% a year. Um, and that means that every year that the homeowner is in the home, they are not going to get the market appreciation on the home. They are going to get 2% every year that they are in the home. This is how we're able to keep the home permanently affordable and affordable for that next family that may need it once the original family is ready to sell. And we are looking at uh, deploying a ground lease and typically with a ground lease becomes an administrative fee. So we've looked at $30 a month as a fair and reasonable fee that every homeowner that's on the community land trust will be, um, will be charged every month. Some other parts of our program design is that we want to make sure that homeowners do have the ability to go ahead and refinance their property in the future if they need to. But what we want to do is we want to cap what they can refinance for. So we're looking at a refinance limit 
of 90% of the resale restricted value. Now, I, I do these presentations a lot and I hear a lot of folks say, why would you ever want to restrict what somebody can refinance their house for? If they can refinance for 100%, why wouldn't you want that to be done? Through our lived experience and through my lived experience running a community land trust, if we allow folks to go ahead and refinance for 100% of the value, then if something does happen within a year or two that that homeowner does need to sell the property, then that homeowner may have to bring money to the closing table to actually sell, sell the property. So we want to make sure that there's always some of their own equity that's built into these transactions. And we thought 10% was, was a good amount to leave in the property just in case if they do need to sell it's not like they have to write a check to cover closing costs and, and, and other fees. We are going to be deploying a capital improvement policy that's going to have uh, two distinct uh, functions to it. One is that a capital improvement is going to be triggered when the capital improvement is 10% of the sale price. And we're also going to be crafting a list of improvements that the homeowners will know this is a capital improvement, this is not. Um, and that the improvements are going to be depreciated over time. And these are traditional industry standards um, that we're going to be deploying. The idea is that we want to create this community land trust with a stewardship philosophy that is going to be centered around community build. So while we have a community land trust that is going to be uh, you know, working citywide in the city of Greensboro, we're also going to be uh, working on centering our work in the communities in which we're going to be working. So these are some of the important program elements that, that we're going to be uh, continuing to develop and deploy. Now, with, within stewardship, we understand that there are already existing organizations that can do some of this work in partnership with the new community land trust. The community land trust is predominantly set up to be a complementary piece with inside of the affordable housing ecosystem with inside Greensboro and not to be a competitive uh, or organization. So, excuse me. So here are a list of topics that we are going to be partnering with existing groups on. One is just homeowner education. The next is neighbor to neighbor connections, money management, wills and estates, home repair, home maintenance prevention, and the important foreclosure prevention. Again, we're going to be working with existing organizations that are already doing some of this work and making sure that our future homeowners can also participate in some of these programs. There's no need to recreate the wheel if the wheel is already working very well in your city. As we think about development strategies, we have already uh, looked at a number of different strategies that this community land trust can go ahead and actually deploy. So one is new construction. Uh, we know that the city of Greensboro owns land that they have acquired in a number of different ways. So being able to literally build a home from the ground up is uh, important in terms of a development strategy. The other one is that the city and other partners may get donations of homes that may need a little bit of rehab. Again, so a, re a rehab uh, strategy is also going to be a part of this community land trust, along with a buyer's choice model, along with thinking about estates and how we have some families that may not have that next generation to go ahead and to pass on their home to, but how can their home continue to be an asset for the community? And that's where they may be able to donate as a part of their estate to the community land trust. We already have some initial uh, end mortgage financing partners uh, with Land Home Financial, Thrive Mortgage, and Tomo Mortgage 
that are excited to partner with the community land trust to provide those end mortgages for homeowners that, that want to be a part of the community land trust. We are going to be talking with some local lenders, but, but we as Grounded Solutions have a partnership with these three national lenders that do work in all 50 states. So they've agreed that they are definitely going to be partnering with the CLT and providing that important financing that the homeowners need. Now, when the question has come up a few times around where will the community land trust work? And uh, working with the city, one of the things that we have uh, deployed and has been a request of council is that the community land trust align itself with inside the redevelopment and reinvestment areas. Now, as a national consultant, I think that this is, you know, a very wise move because a lot of times when you're doing redevelopment or reinvestment, a lot of times that's where we see a lot of displacement happening. Having the community land trust be there to be able to develop affordable housing will be able to mitigate around that displacement factor that does come when there's redevelopment and reinvestment in, in areas. So here is where the community land trust is going to start. But we are also organizing this community land trust to be able to work citywide. So if there is an opportunity outside of these areas that the community land trust can actually work in, then the community land trust is going to evaluate that opportunity and possibly seize it. So one of the things that we are continuing to work on is continuing to get feedback. So here are you know, the dates and the locations where we had our in-person you know, workshops with the same presentation back in January. Uh, we are doing uh, two Zoom calls, one today and also uh, one on Thursday to continue to get feedback from folks because we know that this is a new concept. The city is very aware that they cannot help support the startup of a community land trust if we cannot get the support of the community um, and, and that the community thinks that this is a good idea. We're gonna be incorporating the feedback into the business plan, into the program design that, that we talked about today. And that we expect that uh, towards the end of next month, that we're gonna be starting what's phase three of the work. And that is really standing up the organization and really uh, finishing off the program design. So we do have a number of um, ideas and we would love to get your continued uh, feedback. So here are, um, and Troy, I'm not sure if you guys have a hyperlink um, uh, to the actual survey, but, but, but here's where we would love to get feedback on is what do you like about the community land trust and what is still not clear about the community land trust? Again, your feedback will help as we uh, finish off the business plan and as we continue working into phase three of, of this work. So Jason, what we will do, um, I'll get the communications department to create a link for the survey mm -hmm. and we will send it uh, to all the emails of the registered participants here and we'll also post it on the website. Great. So again, there will be opportunities even as we sort of wrap up this presentation, we're going to have some time if folks have additional questions, if folks want to give us uh, some feedback now, we would be more than sort of happy to take it all. Again, for more information, um, you know, the city of Greensboro has a, has a website that is uh, set up with a number of resources and is where we have been posting a lot of our material as we continue through this process. Here is Troy's information. Here is my information. Um, if for some reason after the call, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I did want to ask this question. I would encourage folks to reach out to Troy. And if you cannot get a hold of him, then you can definitely get a hold of me. 
So with that, I wanna thank you guys. Again, this is the presentation that we've done uh, for the uh, in-person events that we wanted to make sure that we gave folks the opportunity on a virtual platform to be able to take a look at. And with that, what are your questions? So Jason, there is a question in the chat. Um, it is from Hayden. It says, I am a homeowner in the Glenwood area. One potential land trust site for Greensboro. Is it possible for me to donate my home or land to the CLT while still living in it? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say that there's, I, I always live under anything as possible. It's just a matter of trying to figure out what's the right path for you as a homeowner and what is the right path for the community land trust. So we can definitely talk a little bit about what it would take, what it would look like, what would some of those terms be. Uh, we have developed um, that type of strategy before in other cities, so it, it is possible. That was the only question in the chat. I did ask if there's any others. Is it okay uh, if I hop off mute for a second? Please. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just to expand a little bit. Um, I think there are a number of homeowners in the Glenwood area, particularly that would be interested in doing the same. So I'm excited to hear that that is a is an option. Um, and I did have one more question, if that's okay, while other people think please. about think about theirs. Um, I'm wondering about. Uh, like plans for supporting homeowners that are that are just getting into their homes. So I think about like Habitat for Humanity, and there's you know a group in Greensboro who are really struggling to pay for some of the needed repairs mm -hmm. and remediation to their homes. Um, so and maybe that was the capital improvement plan you're speaking to, but I'm curious if there's structures in place to support homeowners. Um, especially low-income homeowners who might not be prepared to take on, you know, huge repair expenses or the different costs that that are associated with homeownership. Yeah, no, absolutely. With inside of a community land trust, it is a part of that stewardship function where the community land trust will design different workshops, bring different partners together. Um, more more than likely, the the city always. Most cities have developed a repair sort of grant program or deferred loan program that can also be very favorable in terms of needing the resources. So it is a part of that sort of stewardship program design that is going to be a part of phase three as we start to really think about what are some of the elements that we really want to make sure that the community land trust is supporting. And then from there, what are going to be some of the policies that we're going to be putting into place to make sure that those things get done and then back that up with procedures that the staff will be able to easily follow. So so, so those things are definitely top of mind because we don't want to invest all this money and then all of a sudden in a few years the homeowners either don't know how to, you know, uh, sand down that porch and put on a new, you know, layer of paint. And then we got, you know, a nice CLT home that that has all peeling paint on it. So so those are things that we want to be very, very deliberate and make sure that we're creating programs and opportunities for for homeowners to engage with the community and land trust so that they have what they need. So in the chat, awesome. Jason. Thank the, you. So in the chat, the next question is: With phase three expected to start in April, is there a tentative timeline for when the land trust program will be up and running? It's a great question. So I mean, right right now, what we're expecting is we're for phase three, and phase three actually incorporates a number of different tasks that are looking at sort of uh, standing up the community land trust making sure the new nonprofits there, making sure the new boards there, supporting the staff. I would expect that we're probably uh, looking at eight to 12 months um, as, as a rough sort of timeline. It can, be as, it can be as soon as eight months, 
but it also can be as long as uh, 12 months to make sure that we have all the pieces in place to be able to take care of our first project. Next question is, do the properties need to be contiguous or within a certain distance from one another? Hmm. It's a great question, Alex. And I would say one of the things that community land trusts have done both. So we've had community land trusts that do what's called a scattered site portfolio where they don't need to be near one another. So one of the, you know, one of the cities that is one of the top five largest here in the country is Houston, Texas. And the Houston Community Land Trust has CLT properties all throughout their entire state. I mean, in, in their entire city. Um, and they work hard to make sure that there is connections within one another, but it does not necessarily need to be contiguous. It can actually be uh, spread out as well. So from Connie, hello, I may have missed this question or answer. Can current homeowners become invested in the community land trust and invested in the nonprofit that will run or operate the CLT? So, so, so Connie, I think one of the question, one of my clarifying questions is when you say invested, what do you mean? Uh, because the community land trust is a nonprofit organization and because it's going to be designed as a nonprofit, um, not a lot of, uh, it's not as attractive in terms of an investment vehicle for individuals. But if folks want to go ahead and donate into the community land trust, then they can receive those tax benefits because the land trust is going to be on a, um, is going to be a 501c3 tax exempt organization. Okay. So it's okay if I come off mute really quick. Please, please, Connie. Um, so I, I don't mean investing investing in a financial gain type mm. of way. What I mean is become a member of the board, becoming being on the um member uh, the operandum agreement as it's being started. How does one participate if we live in that in any of these neighborhoods to become a part of that development process of the nonprofit? Absolutely. That's that's more of a question for Troy and for Grant than than myself. Yeah. So as we uh, start this process, um, we're going to be depending a lot upon the business plan and the uh, bylaws development as well as the policies. So we do have a steering committee that is in place. Um, that was uh, part of the phase two development, and uh, we'll be. Uh, bouncing some of that business plan uh, off of that steering committee uh, as they are citizens from your community uh, that are uh, representing you. Then we'll be able to communicate that into phase three. Now, obviously, at the very beginning of uh, the creation of the nonprofit and the appointment of its boards, we will have to utilize a, uh, a governmental process that I don't know has been finalized yet. Um, but we will be seeking that guidance from the city manager's office uh, which is who we as staff report to, and then uh, them from the city council. Uh, so that really can't answer that question, and I hate that I jumped all the way around it, but the the city will have to utilize a process uh, to formulate that initial board, and then the bylaws will dictate the uh, election process by which those positions are elected for every time that after that. Now, if you are interested in... Um, uh, participating on committees or, or groups or want us to put your uh, name uh, listed on an, our engagement directory, which is where we pull the uh, initial uh, group from for the steering committee. You're welcome to send me your information. Um, I put my information there in the chat um, and uh, and I'll get it. Uh, I'll get it. Get your information on name, address, phone number uh, and email address so that when opportunities come up, we'll reach out to you. Okay, and as that process continues to develop, because it sounds like it just hasn't, we just haven't reached the point to have the answers to those questions yet. Um, as that process continues to unfold, will you all continue to have these public forums where there'll be discussion or are those sound like closed meetings between steering committees and um, governmental processes? So will yeah, it be public? 
will you will that be discussed as well it will be so the reason it's not been engaged yet is because it is completely encased in phase three and i do not yet have a we do not have a contract with between the city and grounded solutions network for the activities that are listed in phase three so we've had those discussions already with jason so we kind of know what things are forthcoming we know kind of what our process is that we need to seek out with the city manager's office um However, in uh, one of the things that we're going to do is we do put everything on the CLT site um, and we will list the uh, the information for the steering committee. And one of the things that I will discuss with uh, with our director, Director Kennedy, um, is an opportunity for us to start keeping um, minutes uh, or notes of the steering committee meetings so that uh, on that site, um, we can keep those posted so that those that are those of you that are following along that you're able to simply click on and see, you know, what activity the steering committee is going as we move through this process. Um, but yeah, this we're going to keep the process as transparent as possible. And as soon as I know anything, um, you know, as you go forward, we will outline it and keep the um, uh, keep the website up to date as best we can. Okay, thank you. I think that'll go a long way with community trust. Um, and for those um, for especially for my family, I have an older generation of family in those neighborhoods and they're not necessarily tapped into um, what's happening online as much as I am. And so I'm able to and, and um, even send in emails and things like that. And so I want to be able to see what's happening and as it unfolds and be able to participate and keep them involved as much as possible. They can be present in person when um, those types of things are, are available. But um, having that information out there will be very helpful. I know at least for uh, my family and friends. Absolutely, thank you. Jason and Troy, this is Dan Curry. Um, great presentation. Um, wanted to kind of follow up on the partnership um, that was mentioned, building partnerships with other organizations. You know, Greensboro is fortunate enough to have a number of housing support organizations, um, particularly for homeowners. And I don't know if you've done any outreach yet to um, groups like Housing Consultants Group that does um, a lot of pre-owner um, uh, education and guidance, um, getting homeowners ready for homeownership or housing um, Greensboro Housing Coalition that um, would be a, a great organization to partner with for homeownership assistance, you know, once folks are in homes. Um, in fact, they just recently had a workshop um, talking about, you know, how to stay in your home and how to maintain it. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are, are great opportunities. We don't have to recreate those wheels here yep. at all. Um, so hopefully you'll be reaching out to them. Now, I had a second question, and it was about the maintenance issues. You mentioned um, trying to develop low-maintenance um, yep. projects. Um, you know, anytime you paint a house, that's not low maintenance. So, um, <laughs> are you looking at the potential or, or even in other communities where you're doing this, uh, using low maintenance materials like vinyl siding and brick, which are, are more permanent, although, you know, vinyl is debatable how long, you know, how permanent it is, but, um, you know, maintenance is a huge issue. We've learned that here, uh, the hard way with a lot of buildings that were built with hardy board that are now beginning to wear out. Um, so what are you looking at along those lines? Yeah, it's a great question, Dan. And the great thing is that uh, the technology in the building material ecosystem continues to advance every single day. So um, we have guiding principles. We haven't looked at any specific products yet. But it is those guiding principles to make sure that we're looking at products that at least give us, you know, 60 to 70 years of wear and tear, uh, you know, before before we think about. And, and as you know, and as most folks know, that there's some trade offs of each of these products, you know, hardy, hardy, you know, if you can get certain sort of uh, maintenance uh, regimens on hardy on a hardy board, it can actually last up to 50 years. Now, the challenge is that most folks always felt like, oh yeah, coming out of the factory, it's gonna be a 50 year product. 
well, everything needs at least a little bit of maintenance. And folks thought that you could just put up Hardy and a Hardy was just going to last. And I, I think some folks are realizing, oh, no, wait a minute, there is maintenance even in Hardy Bay. So, but Hardy looks better than vinyl. And that's where it's like trying to figure out the aesthetics and making sure that the quality of the products are of the highest ca caliber. So those are guiding principles that we continue to think about. But we, we, don't, we don't go into the fine details until we get to an actual project. Because as, as most folks know, when you're in those details, a lot of it has to deal with the trade-offs of resources at the table and the size of the property that you can actually construct and build. But but thank you for calling out two great, you know, potential partners for the Community Land Trust. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a part of the phase three work is building out what those partnerships look like, what the CLT is specifically going to be doing, and what the other uh, organizations that are in this ecosystem and what they're good at and what we can uh, really rely on them to bring to the table. So Jason, another um, question's in the chat. And I think this goes toward uh, some of the information that came up during some of the other public sessions was that even though the uh, cities identified the need for uh, a possible community land trust uh, that would um, enrich or support the redevelopment reinvestment areas of the city, the land trust that is that you're guiding us for its development would benefit the entire city. Mm. in which the the parts of it could exist any, anywhere in the city. So to um, Hayden's question is, will board members uh, all be residents of the neighborhoods of the CLTs? So that yeah, uh, that's a unique question. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think that's one of the great features of the Community Land Trust is that, you know, we're, we're developing a Community Land Trust and by its definition, the majority of those board members are going to be residents of the neighborhoods that the CLT is going to be operating. So, so when you think about a pie and you can cut it into three different, um, three different sections, uh, a third of that board is going to be made up of what's called community residents, people that live in those communities that the CLT is going to be working in. Another third of that um, board of directors will eventually be homeowners that are leasing land from the community land trust. So we're going to have the homeowners that are specifically a part of that community land trust sit on that board of directors and have a third of those seats dedicated for them. And then the last third in our board of directors pie, as I like to call it, is going to be set up for other stakeholders that you know want to come in and want to help to support the community land trust. But two thirds of that board is going to be made up of those residents in the neighborhood that the community land trust are operating under. And that's where for for the our structure that we're proposing is not just the board members but also all of the committees that are going to be doing work outside of the board that are also going to be made up of residents in the community, that those decisions can be a shared decision making along with the board of directors. That's that's really helpful. Um, just I have one clarifying question, sure. which is. The second third you mentioned is people who you said are leasing Correct. in these neighborhoods. And I'm curious, like, does that mean owner occupied homes or can that include like investors who are are renting to people? Does that make sense? Yeah. So when, when I say leasing, they're leasing from the community land trust. So so whether that is home ownership or whether that's rental, um, those individuals that have a contractual agreement with the community land trust will have seats on the board of directors. So is it possible that there will be like 
big investment firms that are making decisions for the community, no. like on the board of the Community Land Trust? Absolutely not. Uh, no. And just to just to clarify, Hayden, real quick, when Jason's talking about leasing as a homeowner in the Community Land Trust, yes, you own the home, you ground lease the property from the Community Land Trust. So essentially, yeah, it's the homeowners in the community that are active on community land trust property that are eligible to be on the board, uh, as okay. well as as well as as well as community members in the surrounding neighborhood. But yeah, to your point, there is no there is there is no role or no envisioned uh, participation by you know, investment um, firms or you know, non-resident non-owner occupied, non-residents of the community. Awesome, that really gets to the heart of what I was asking is just making sure that like the people who are making decisions about the community land trust are the people most impacted by those decisions. So I appreciate, I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. As what I continue to remind folks, there is no, uh, there is no community in if if there's no community in CLT, then you don't have a CLT. Our founders were very, very uh, explicit that they put the word community, which means residents that, you know, either own or are renting in that area and that they should be the decision makers on what happens in their own community. So that's an important element. And that's what gets to membership and governance. Um, for the organization and for the CLT, so. All right, are there any other questions? If not, we're coming up on the one o'clock hour. We wanna thank uh, Jason for being with us. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Um, and please uh, follow the uh, website for um, the Community Land Trust, it is the city's web address at www.greensboro-nc.gov forward slash CLT. Uh, and we'll keep uh, things up to date. Our next Zoom meeting is going to be on Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, you're also welcome to join again at that time. And if you know of anybody in, uh, in the community that you can share this information with, please go to the link and share that information so that they can register and take part as well. Um, and if that's it. Thank you all so very much, and y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you all.